so at a loss to explain what is causing this weather and why it is taking quite a while. That sudden drop in temperature has half an hour ago. Mexican officials closed the border. In the line of so many U.S. refugees. We prepare to go live to Los Angeles. Are you getting into the camera now? What you see is happening now. Look over there behind me. That's a, a tornado. Yes, a twister. This is just massive. This is in northern Iran, and the rushing water collapses homes right in front of us here. Look at this. 16 people are known dead, dozens still missing. In addition to these homes, the water swept away at least 25 cars as well. Like that. This was actually a 4.0 earthquake, okay? So it's definitely big enough that a lot of people felt it, and I think that was kind of the unique thing about this situation. Now, the earthquake happened in Fremont along the Hayward Fault, okay? So if you look at the Hayward Fault, it kind of runs parallel to the San Francisco Bay, it runs through some big areas like Oakland, Hayward, and of course Fremont as well. Luckily, no injuries have been reported. Uh, as we watch this thing live. This is a uh, video from just a moment ago of the DC-10 doing what it does best, uh, dumping a big a bunch of that retardant down to try and get this thing under control because it has closed a road, the main thoroughfare through that area. Photos taken on board United Flight 447 tell the story. After one passenger fell ill shortly after taking off from Denver Wednesday morning, more passengers started complaining of sickness. They've got several sick passengers. Uh, six passengers have passed out, several more are ill. A lot of people were jolted awake in the middle of the night in San Francisco on Tuesday morning. You know what? It was an earthquake. Yeah, and a lot of people felt it. The USGS is estimating about 6 million people felt this thing, but there were a lot of tweets like this coming out of that area. Lots of shaking and rattling at my place, no damage that I can see. And the Fremont police confirms that there's been no freeway damage, no building damage, anything like that. This was actually a 4.0 earthquake, okay? So it's definitely big enough that a lot of people felt it, and I think that was kind of the unique thing about this situation. Now, the earthquake happened in Fremont along the Hayward Fault, okay? So if you look at the Hayward Fault, it kind of runs parallel to the San Francisco Bay, it runs through some big areas like Oakland, Hayward, and of course Fremont as well. Luckily, no injuries have been reported. Remarkable video to show you now as flash flooding sweeps through a village in Iran. This is in northern Iran and the rushing water collapses homes right in front of us here. Look at this. 16 people are known dead, dozens still missing. In addition to these homes, the water swept away at least 25 cars as well. Goodness. In the future, there could be major flooding along every coast, so says a new study that warns the world's seas are rising. Jim Axelrod has that part of the story. Ever-warming oceans melting polar ice could raise sea levels 15 feet in the next 50 to 100 years. NASA's former climate chief now says five times higher than previous predictions. Well, this is the biggest threat that the planet faces. 
James Hansen co-authored the new journal article raising that alarming scenario. If we get sea level rise of several meters, all coastal cities become dysfunctional. If ocean levels rise just 10 feet, look what happens to Miami, Seattle, and New York City. Just six feet of water would do this to Fulton Street in Lower Manhattan, this to Harvard University in Massachusetts, and this to Galveston, Texas. The melting ice would cool ocean surfaces at the poles even more while the overall climate continues to warm. The temperature difference would fuel even more volatile weather. As the atmosphere gets warmer and holds more water vapor, that's going to drive stronger thunderstorms, stronger hurricanes, stronger tornadoes, because they all get their energy from the water vapor. Nearly a decade ago, Hansen told 60 Minutes we had 10 years to get a handle on global warming. It will be a situation that is out of our control. We would reach a tipping point. We're essentially at the edge of that. That's why this year is a critical year. Critical because of a United Nations meeting in Paris in December designed to reach legally binding agreements on carbon emissions, Charlie, those greenhouse gases that create global warming. Thanks, Jim. United Airlines is inspecting a plane this morning to find out what made a number of passengers sick. Oxygen masks were released yesterday on the flight from Denver to Los Angeles. One person was taken to the hospital. Chris Van Cleve is in Washington with the passenger stories. Chris, good morning. Good morning. The Airbus A320 was forced to make an emergency landing in Grand Junction, Colorado. That's just about 250 miles west of Denver. Firefighters described whatever happened as a chain reaction that left as many as 20 of the 156 people on board feeling ill. And so far, there's no explanation as to why. Photos taken on board United Flight 447 tell the story. After one passenger fell ill shortly after taking off from Denver Wednesday morning, more passengers started complaining of sickness. They've got several sick passengers. Uh, six passengers have passed out, several more are ill. Then the man directly behind me started passing out, and then other people started passing out. And there was people vomiting and dizzy, and it was very unpleasant. A spokesperson for United Airlines says the crew then decided to deploy the plane's oxygen masks. Jason Pedruzzi took this picture of himself and his daughter, Victoria. It was scary, and it was just, it, I just wanted everyone to be okay. It was yeah. uh, some men, adult men, that were visibly shaken. Also on board was WWE superstar Seamus. He tweeted this photo, writing, Not many brave lads when the masks drop from overhead. And United 447, uh, the only information I got is there was smoke in the aircraft. Is that a true statement? Local firefighters boarded the plane upon landing and tweeted, No smoke in the aircraft. Smoke report came from deployment of the oxygen mask, dusty and powder from storage. We're still not sure the nature of what exactly happened, but the people that were feeling well, uh, poorly are feeling better now that they're all on oxygen. One passenger was taken to the hospital. The Grand Junction Fire Department says it evaluated between 15 and 20 passengers for symptoms including headaches and nausea. But the reason for the illnesses is still unclear. I have no idea, but you can't fake projectile vomiting. You certainly can't. United Airlines says the passengers continued on to Los Angeles on a different airplane, adding a maintenance team is inspecting the aircraft in question to determine if there were any kind of mechanical issues. The man who was hospitalized is expected to be okay. Gail. The skies darkened over Indonesia this week as five volcanoes erupted at virtually the same time, spewing ash and smoke across the archipelago in Southeast Asia. On Wednesday, steam and debris hurtled some 6,000 feet into the air from the eruption atop Mount Rong on Java Island. And these mountains spit ash and smoke in the Moluccas Islands. Next, it was the Sinabung volcano's turn to display its natural force. Mount Kuranjtan completed the quintet of combustion as more than 13,000 people were evacuated throughout Indonesia. Some 130 active volcanoes sit among Indonesia's more than 17,000 islands. Experts say the concurrent activity was a natural yet not extraordinary occurrence. I'm Matt Sampson, The Weather Channel.
Good evening, everybody. I'm C.J. Ward. And I'm Beth Farnsworth. Our top story at 5, an alarming discovery in Ventura County. Thousands of fish found dead in the J Street drainage canal on the border of Oxnard and Port Wyneme. News Channel 3's Kelsey Gerkins joins us live from Port Wyneme. And Kelsey, at this point, it's a mystery. Yeah, that's right, Beth and CJ. I just spoke with a biologist that's getting water samples from this drainage culvert, and he tells me at this time it is unclear exactly why there are thousands of dead fish here. Now, the most alarming news about this is there is at least nine different species of dead fish here, including saltwater as well as freshwater fish. Now, residents first reported the dead fish yesterday, and they noticed a large amount of fish of all sizes stuck in the Matur County Watershed Protection District drain near Wainimi Road and J Street. By this morning, crews were at the drain cleaning up the dead fish and rescuing the ones that were still alive. While it is still unclear where the fish came from, several local residents are believing one theory, that water levels rose during the weekend storms and then dropped suddenly, sending the fish from the Ormond Beach Lagoon to the drain and then stranding them there. Looks like thousands because there's small fish there's huge fish and it, there's no water on this side but that water is full so it looks like it's clogging the water from coming through <laughs> i've never smelled anything like this before the smell of the dead fish is noticeable for a good half mile around the drain and while the area is fenced off kids are still sneaking around the fence to check out the dead fish against the wishes of county authorities and biologists tell me that the endangered goby fish there were a few of them found in here but thankfully the ones that they found were alive and they were able to rescue them now crews have left at this point, but they are expected to be out here again tomorrow morning along with biologists trying to figure out exactly what caused these thousands of fish to wash up dead here. Sinkhole in Citrus County so big it actually swallowed a large truck. The workers nearby incredibly making it out okay. ABC Action News reporter Jacqueline Inglaise joining us now live with an update out there. Jacqueline. Oh, Wendy, the scene in this Beverly Hills yard, something more like you'd see out of a movie set. Take a look here behind me. This is a drill rig stricking out of the ground here. Take a look down 30 feet into this hole. You can see this truck was swallowed up by this sinkhole. The back end of it barely, barely visible as it's covered in dirt. Now, this homeowner telling us just a few minutes ago that workers were on his property drilling him a new water well when this happened. The family has not had running water for a week. Workers called him home around 1 o'clock, telling him they could feel the ground moving beneath them, and that's when this opened up. Those workers had just gotten out of this truck when it went down into this hole. As you said, all of those workers were able to make it to safety before this truck sank. Here's what this homeowner had to say. Looked like Mother Nature was hungry, and she was in the mood for truck. And there we have it. And back out live now, you can see we have some neighbors gathering around this sinkhole. Kind of can't believe their eyes. Directly behind them, that is a truck that was brought in that's loaded with a thousand gallons of water for this family to use because they are without water until they can pull this truck from out of here. One of the big issues that they're facing tonight can they get a crane large enough back here onto this rural property? To pull this out, and that's seemingly the problem. We have very small streets around here, and a lot of tree covered. So, getting something of that size into here is going to be very, very difficult, very strategically, having to be planned very strategically. We're going to be here throughout the evening. We'll bring you updates on this sinkhole as we get them. For now, we're live in Beverly Hills. Jacqueline Inglace, ABC Action News. Ten news begins with breaking news. We are continuing to follow that growing fire that's threatening homes in Napa County. 
10 News reporter Dan Haggerty has been monitoring the situation since 5 o'clock. He's now in the live center. And Dan, we just learned what caused this fire. Yeah, you can see the live images of the fire growing on the mountainside here behind me. Uh, we're learning that it was caused by a vehicle accident that sparked this thing. This is an idea, idea for you where it's happening. Lake Berryessa is just north of San Francisco, and it's actually an area uh, that generates a lot of the uh, electricity for the North Bay there with a dam that's in the area. And this is the landscape and right around all of this are a bunch of cabins and homes and boat docks. Take a look at the pictures again uh, as we watch this thing live. This is a video from just a moment ago of the DC-10 doing what it does best, uh, dumping a big uh, bunch of that retardant down to try and get this thing under control because it has closed a road, the main thoroughfare through that area. It has caused some evacuations. We do know that, of course, there are a bunch of hiking trails through that area. They had to go in and save some hikers because when these fires get going and it is windy in the area, it moves very, very quickly. So people are in danger as they continue to try and get it under control. We started reporting this at 5 o'clock when it was 300 acres. It's now 1,000 acres um, and it's only 5% contained. That's always a number we throw out there and it's kind of hard to you know, kind of wrap your head around exactly what it means. 5% is not one of those numbers. You can tell this thing is a bit out of control at this point. We're going to continue to keep our eyes on it and keep you updated from here in the Live Center. For now, I'm Dan Haggerty, 10 News. Yeah, busy time during the summer in those areas on the roads and a lot of people camping up at Lake Berryessa. Thank you, Dan. Know you're continuing to watch that. The new model shows the warmest sea surface temperatures in nearly 20 years. The red you see is where the warmer water is. Chief Meteorologist Kristen Van Dyke here in the Weather Center. Mm -hmm. Interpret this for us. <laughs> right. What does this really mean? Okay, so the bottom line, what you're supposed to get from that is they're supposed to look very, very similar, right? Yes. Because back in 1997, 98, the strongest El Nino ever on record at that time, and now we're almost matching that up. And so it looks like we're headed towards a very strong El Nino, too. So what does that even mean? Let's talk about it. So I have a graphic to show you. Whenever an El Nino happens, what happens is you have a shift in where that warmer water is, where that warmer water over the equatorial Pacific is situated. And so during an El Nino, it all shifts to the east. And where that warmer water is concentrated, that's what fuels the jet stream. And so that means that the jet stream uh, starts to shift in its track. That's where these storm systems develop. So when you have the warmer water shifting to the east, you have a shift in that jet stream, and that means the storm track typically uh, takes a southerly dip. And so that is great news for California, but what it means for us here in the Pacific Northwest typically is that it's very warm for us and it's very dry for us compared to normal. A teenager who built that gun drone is facing charges, but it's not about the drone. He's accused of roughing up two police officers. And News 8's Jason Newton has gone through the documents in this case. He is live in News 8 Control tonight with the very latest. Jason. Darren, and like you said, none of these arrests have anything to do with that viral drone video you just showed, but Austin Howitt has a reputation with law enforcement going back to his days as a juvenile. At 18 years old, Austin Howitt is well known to police in Clinton. We've had multiple interactions with Mr. Uh, Howitt. Uh, unfortunately, there's some of those interactions were as a juvenile I can't comment on. Just days after the release of this video showing a drone that the teenager made firing a pistol while in flight, Howitt was arrested, charged with two counts of assault of an officer. The incident happened when the teenager went to turn himself in for an unrelated warrant Wednesday night and apparently had second thoughts. He had a disagreement with the arresting officer in our front lobby and uh, attempted to exit the building. The officer had to physically restrain him from doing so and an altercation ensued. The initial warrant was for an incident on Sunday. Clinton police say how it was parked at the library after hours and when they approached, they say how it went berserk screaming at the officer before driving away. When he tried to stop him, uh, Mr. Howard initially stopped, questioned the uh, officer's authority for stopping him, and then prior to the officer's backup arriving, Mr. Howard drove away. He stopped a quarter mile up the road, but the teenager kept the car in drive, refused to get out, and screamed at officers that they had no right to detain him. According to the report, Clinton police backed down deciding to leave the teenager alone and instead issue an arrest warrant at a later time. The decision was made at that time 
uh, instead of putting our officers in harm's way of getting injured by a moving motor vehicle, that we would merely uh, culminate the investigation by an arrest warrant. And according to the documents, after turning himself in, how it reportedly vomited several times on himself, he was taken to the hospital where medical staff found a recording device in his underwear. How it apparently wanted to document his interaction with police officers. He did post a $20,000 bond today in court. Live in News 8 Control, I'm Jason Newton. Turkey has been reluctant to join the coalition fighting ISIS, but today in what is being called a game changer, Turkey gave the U.S. permission to use a base in that country to carry out airstrikes against ISIS in Syria. The Turkish military also scrambled its own fighter jets in response to increasing violence at the Syrian border. Holly Williams is in Istanbul. Holly? But Charlie, this switch in Turkey's position comes in a week in which Syria's civil war spilled violently across the country's border. Uh, on Monday, a suicide bomber killed more than 30 people in a Turkish town close to the border, uh, and a government official here told us that he was linked to ISIS. Then today, the Turkish military said that five ISIS gunmen opened fire on a Turkish border post, killing one soldier. So it's possible that Turkey fears that it is losing control of its border and has therefore allowed the U.S. to begin using its airbase to strike ISIS. Also today, Turkey announced that it is building a new wall along sections of its border, presumably to try to stem the flow of foreign fighters into Syria. Holly Williams in Istanbul. Thanks, Holly. This is the worst disturbance in the jail we've had in probably the last five, six years. From Sky 7, McKinley County Detention Center is quiet. But pictures from the ground tell a different story. We had a lot of worry that the rest of the jail may get out of control. Around 1 p.m., jail officials got word that the plumbing was backed up in an inmate housing pot. They started moving dozens of inmates out so crews could fix it. But at 1.33 p.m., officials say the inmates got riled up and started setting fire to their beds and clothing. There was a stack of uh, properties, such as clothing, sheets, bedding, uh, mattress type things that, that are all history. State police and fire crews surrounded the jail. Some of the inmates wouldn't leave the pod, so police used tear gas to force them out. By 3 o'clock, the fire was out and order was restored. No one was seriously hurt, but it's not quite a happy ending. McKinley County now has to clean up thousands of dollars in damage, and the pod can't be used until that's done. And both police and the jail will take a hard look at what happened here. If there's policies we need to change or if, if there's uh, some procedures or even if there was some policies that were violated, we have to investigate all of that. This has been quite a month for the McKinley County Jail. Just a few weeks ago, they had an inmate escape from here. He's since been caught. In Gallup, Matt Howerton, KOAT, Action 7 News. Standing guard. Volunteers armed with weapons are outside of a tri-state military recruitment center right now. It follows a deadly attack in Chattanooga, Tennessee last week that left five people dead. Local 12 News reporter Larry Davis joins us live from Middletown right now after talking with those who believe that this is just the right thing to do. And good afternoon, Larry. And good afternoon to you, John. And this is the Armed Forces Recruiting Center in Middletown. The Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines all have individual offices here. Now, the veterans that you uh, see behind me here are armed, and they say they are here to protect those recruiters. Six military veterans are stationed outside the recruiting center. All are armed, and even one vet has a baseball bat just in case. The vets uh, began coming here this week after the shooting deaths of military personnel. Uh, the shootings are outside a recruiting center in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, as well as a Navy operations support center. That's where the, the uh, military personnel were shot to death. They were not armed, as are recruiters across the country. Now, since then, some states have decided to start arming 
their state National Guard personnel. And these veterans here in Middletown say they're hoping the same thing happens in Ohio. In the meantime, they vow to protect them. That's what we're, <laughs> what we're hoping for. Uh, we're planning on being here until that happens or until, uh, you know, National Guard steps up. You know, whoever, there's, somebody's got to take over and, uh, and protect these people. And John, just a short time ago, a couple came up, to, just got out of the vehicle, came up, shook their hands and said, we want to thank you for what you're doing. And even earlier, a woman came up, dropped off some food and water, uh, thanking them for what they're doing as well. And these uh, veterans here say they're uh, doing it for their country and the people who are serving their country. And they vow to stay here uh, while they can to protect the personnel who work at these recruiting centers. Lot Clashes have erupted between Palestinian mourners and Israeli forces in the West Bank city of Hebron, Al Khalil, following the killing of a Palestinian man. <laughs> Anger boiled over in the occupied region after the 52 year old Palestinian man was shot dead by Israeli troops on Thursday. This was the second such deadly attack in the occupied territories in just two days. On Wednesday, a 22 year old youth was killed as Israeli soldiers opened fire on Palestinians protesting a raid near the city of Jenin. Palestinian resistance groups Hamas and Islamic Jihad strongly condemn the deadly attacks. International organizations and human rights groups have also denounced Israel's human rights violations across the occupied Palestinian territories. <laughs> 